Turn with me, if you will, in Bibles or watch this on the screen. Judges chapter number 8. The book of Judges. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges chapter number 8. Beginning at verse number 4. It's a lengthy reading, but stick with us. It'll bless you. We're still in our series dealing with Gideon, this, this, this servant of God who complained about things in the world. And God says, okay, I'm going to use you to change it. Yeah. And that includes you too. Huh. Listen, you, you, tell your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. you are all oh. throughout this scripture. Yeah. You just got to decide which one it is, all right? You're going to see there's some good folk and some bad folk. Some, some, some honest and good folks, some questionable folk. Amen? Ah. You are all throughout this scripture. Now, it's up to you. When we say amen today, you have to figure out which one you are. Beginning at verse number four. And Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over, and he and the 300 who were with him exhausted and pursuing, yet pursuing. So he said to the men of Sokoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I am pursuing after Zabah and, uh, and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. Now remember, Midian are the bad guys. Midian are the bad guys. And the officials of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, Well then, when the Lord gives, has given Zeba and Zemulon into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and the briars. And went up to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered. And he said to the men of Penuel, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now, Zabah and Zemulon were in the uh, car corps with their army, about 15,000 men, all who were left uh, uh, of the army, of the people of the east. For there had fallen 120,000 men who drew the sword. Verse 11, and, and, and Gideon went up by the way of the tent dwellers near Zabah and Zabaha and uh, attacked the army, for the army fell secure. And Zabah and Zebulun fled and, and pursued them and captured the two kings of Midian, Zabah and Zemunah, and they uh, threw all the army into a panic. Look at verse 13. Then Gib uh, Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle by the ascent of Herez. That doesn't really read well. The, reason, the, the reading really should be by sunrise. Verse 14, and he captured the young man of Sokoth and questioned him. And he wrote down for him the officials and elders of Sokoth, 77 men. And he came to the men of Sokoth and said, Behold, Zabah and Zamulon, who, uh, whom you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Zabah and Zamuna uh, already in your hand that we should give bread to your men who are exhausted? Don't, don't quit, y'all. Don't quit. Stay with me. Verse 16. And, and he took the elders of the city, and he took the thorns of the wilderness and the briars with them, and taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson. And he broke down the towers of Penuel and killed the men of the city. And he said to Zebah and Zemuna, Where are the men whom you killed at Tabor? And he answered, As you are, so, uh, so were they. Every one of them resembled the son of a king. And he said, They were my brothers and sisters of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not kill you. So he said to Je Jether, the firstborn, rise and kill them. But the young man did not draw a sword, for he was afraid because he was still a young man. And Zabah and Zamuna said, arise yourself and fall upon us. For uh, as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and killed Zabah and Zamuna. And he took the crescent, the ornaments that were on their necks, uh, and the necks that were on their camels. I want to talk to us this morning from the topic, not taking sides. It's not an option. Not taking sides is not an option. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you got to make a decision and take a side. Somebody give God praise already. As you take your seats, God bless you. 
Now, that was a lot of reading right there. And, and if you haven't been with us for the last four or five weeks, it, it's kind of confusing. But let me start by saying it like this. We can be some nosy people. And we can get in everybody's business except our own. Somebody say amen right there. And getting in everybody's business, we see stuff that happens, and we quickly become the judge and jury of situations. Whether it's in some people's lives that you know in real life or on TV or in politics or on the news, we'll sit there and watch a story on TikTok or in CNN, and we'll make a decision. And, and, and we'll, we'll say what was right or what was wrong. And then we'll even say what should happen. We'll say, well, I think what ought to happen is she ought to go to jail. Or they better be glad I wasn't there. Because if I had been there, no, you would. You wouldn't have done nothing different. Or, or here's another one. You find out that a friend of yours had gotten into trouble or gotten into a fight or got laid off. And you're quickly to rush to your friend's aid, and you're ready to fight with him or with her. You don't even know the details, but because they're your friend, you're ready to jump in, feet first, and to defend them quickly. But the opposite is also true. There are times when we're scared. We really don't know the details, but we're ready to kind of sit on the side and watch your friend suffer or watch the situation go down. We got enough mess going on on TV right now, in the movies, in our own lives, in real life politics. And it's so crazy, we don't really know what side to take. So we sitting there and we watching, and then we call each other, text each other, Snapchat each other. Did you see what they said? I can't believe it. Well, which way do you think, which way are you leaning? I don't know. I ain't sure yet. They all crazy. I don't know which side to take. And we sit there, and then we have to call somebody who got better knowledge than us. And then we call somebody, and we hope, Sister Kim, who can help us with the legal implications of everything we just saw. Because the problem with us, Sister Kim, is we try to play lawyer. Well, you know, you know what the Constitution says, and, and, and they don't even say that. And you're not even a constitutional lawyer or, or whatever kind of you think you ought to be. So we try to stay out of the business. But every now and then, we stay out at the wrong time. We grow weary of the status quo, and we want somebody to do something. I can't believe the principal of that school allowed that mess to go on. I can't believe the city council voted that way and passed that ordinance. I can't believe Congress passed that bill. But the reason they passed that bill is you didn't vote. You stayed home. And when they passed the bill and raised your taxes, you stayed home then, but now you see the bill and you say, oh! That's what they were talking about. Yeah! But you didn't want to get involved. You know, they all crazy. That ain't my business. I, I, don't, I stay out of politics. Well, you in it now. That new high water bill, you're going to pay that bad boy because you stayed silent. You stayed quiet. You're going to talk about politics now. We all want to stay quiet. We all get hushed quiet. Listen, there are times in our lives when you got to speak up when it ain't popular. You got to make a decision. But we stay quiet. Now, before we were in everybody's business, now we're staying quiet. Listen, let me bring it home a little bit. Your own personal life. Yeah. When Sarah needed to sign up for that class, but she was reluctant to do so, now she needs to sign up. When, when John was hesitant about telling his neighbor about the noise about his barking dog, when, when Mark was unwilling to vote for another congressperson, we all have those issues where we needed to say something or do something, but we decided to stay quiet. And one of the reasons we stay quiet is we, we, we already, listen, listen to me, we have already decided that our decision ain't that important or nobody's going to listen to me or it ain't going to matter one way or the other. 
But what we really mean is, I don't want to get involved and take sides because it may be tough to follow the decision that I just made. Or it's going to be painful because I found out that my cousin thinks opposite of the way I think. And my family is all messed up because I voted this way or I have this kind of opinion. So I'm just going to stay out of it. But listen, you don't have that option when it comes to God. Taking sides is not an option. You're either for God or you're not. And there are times when you take a decision for the Lord that's by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it ain't popular, but it's right. Somebody say amen right there. When the decision is in front of us, and God doesn't always give the easy answer, but he gives the right answer. You better follow the Lord. Gideon found out. You better follow the Lord. There are times in our lives when something comes up that we better make a decision, especially as it relates to the Lord. Uh, uh, most part of our lives, you need to make sure that the wisdom of God lines up with the word of God, and then you need to make a move. Listen, there are too many times where God has already given us his wisdom and his word, and, and you need to make a move, and you say stuff like this, well, I was going to make a decision, but I, I, I'm going to pray on it. When God says go, what are you praying on? Ah, when God says you need to cut that girl loose, you need to cut that guy loose. I ain't talking about your husband or wife. You're already in it now. You got you to deal with that. But you sitting there dating somebody on the side. She mistreating you. He mistreating you. Well, I ain't so sure. I'm checking with God. Checking with God. He treats you like a dog. She treats you like a dog. And you're trying to make a decision? God already told you not to get with them anyway. And now here you are sitting there wrestling. You know, we, we, there's some clear things. God says, give your tithes and offerings. You don't need to pray about that. That's a command. That ain't something that the pastor wants you to do. That's something that God says do to show your love for him. God says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So when you come to church, you've been obedient. That's not something you need to pray about. You don't wake up on Sunday morning and say, well, I'm trying to decide if I need to go to church. If God woke you up this morning, started you on your way, gave you air in your lungs, blood in your veins, gave you the house that you're sitting in, the bed you just got up off of, the food in your refrigerator, the air in your house, and you're trying to decide if, there ain't no if, you go celebrate and serve the Lord. There's just something you need to just do. There's some things you just do. Ah! We, we sit on the sidelines too much trying to decide, trying to decide. We can be some indecisive people. Now, see, we were decisive when it was about you. See, when I look at you in your situation, I can give you all the advice in the world. See, what I think you ought to do is, ah, but it's about me now. Well, I don't know. I need to pray on it. Now, there's some things God already told us to just do. We just need to do. Amen? There are just some things we need to do. Let me give you some background, some context for those of you who haven't been with us. The book of Judges. The book of Judges is before we start seeing kings in the Bible. God has given us creation in Genesis. He saw the people leave Egypt in the book of Exodus and gave us the law. Uh, uh, Genesis is Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then he gave us a leader, a, a leader, a Jewish leader named Joshua. Joshua died, and now Joshua is off the scene. So there's nobody to lead God's people. And that's dangerous, because anytime there's not a leader, everybody do what they want to do. And that's how we get to this text now. In Judges, the book of Judges, the people, God's people, these are not some heathen somewhere. These are God's people. Somebody say God's people. These are God's people, just like today, the church or God's people. Everybody was serving other gods and not serving the Lord. They forgot that he brought them through the Red Sea. They forgot that he gave them food and gave them water in the wilderness. They forgot that he gave them clothes that didn't wear out. They forgot that he gave shoes that wouldn't wear out. They forgot, and they were doing their own thing. And everybody started serving other guys. They came into the new land and started serving heathen gods. Now listen, you don't have to go far. 
All you have to do is start looking at the United States of America. We're doing everything except worshiping God. We're doing everything except coming to church on Sundays. And we find every reason not to worship God. So what God did is he says, okay, fine, this is what we're going to do. Since y'all turned your back on me, I haven't left you, but you left me. And I love you so much, I'm going to spank you because God disciplines those who love. That's scripture. And he says, because you turned to idols. You turn to people who really don't love you. You turn to people who will use you and abuse you, and I'm going to punish you to make you turn back to me and realize I can't do it without you, God. I can't do it without you. Has anybody been there? Listen, I've been there. I've been there where I said, Lord, I've been a fool for less. I'm coming back to church. That was back in 1987, and I ain't looked back since. How many of you have been like me when you said, I done done enough crazy out there. It's time to give God praise. I know I'm right about that. I know I'm right about that. So here we are. So he says, but y'all can't do it on your own. See, the battle was spiritual. We turned our back on God. The the emphasis is it affected us physically. That's what happened in the text. They turned their back on God. So God allowed the enemy to come into their neighborhood and and camp on their front yard. So that's where we are in chapter 6. But then somebody speaks up in the sanctuary. God, why don't you do something? Who was that? That was, that was Gideon. Everybody turned out Gideon. There's always one in the classroom. And everybody, and so God says, Gideon, I'm going to use you. And Gideon says, I'm scared. He says, I know you're scared. That's why I can use you. Because when the battle is won, I get the credit, not you. Do I have a witness in the house? Have you ever been afraid to follow the Lord? Have you Now, be honest. Have you been afraid to say, Lord, I don't understand enough about the Bible. I don't stay, understand how you work. But I know you do some mysterious stuff, and you do it supernaturally, and you do it powerfully. And when it's done, we know it was you. God says, so I decided to use Gideon. Fast forward. He says, okay, Gideon, I'm going to let you beat these guys. And so Gideon shows up with 32,000 men by the power of the Holy Spirit. He collected them, and there they are. But God whittled them down to 300. Everybody say 300. And so God sends them from 32,000 down to 300. And they said they're going like, because the ones who left were scared. Everybody say scared. There are times when everybody hears the same sermon, but many leave scared. The others leave determined and they go forward and battle amen? amen so here he is and so we saw the battle where he allowed the 300 to surround the enemy of the Midianites and the Midianites don't have 32,000 they have 135,000 men and all their camels and all their swords and they're ready to go to war and God allows his people his men under the leadership of his servant, Gideon, to surround the enemy between 10 and midnight. And there, the enemy is in a valley, but God's people are on the ridge all around the edges. And they show their torches, and they blow their horns repeatedly. So it sounds like thousands and thousands of people surrounding them. This is pitch black at night. And so God allows, listen to me, God allows the men in the valley to be confused and to turn on each other. And they slaughter each other. There's 135,000 and 120,000 die in the valley. I'm telling you, God can fight your battles if you just follow what he says to do. He told his people, he says, Light your torches, blow your horn, and stand still. Oh, God can do a whole lot if we just stand still and shut up. So then then the Lord allows them to, a few to, those who escape, or where we are today, this is where we pick up on the story today, that God is fighting his battle through his people his way. But not taking sides is not an option. The first thing we notice is I want to give you three things to take home. Thank you for visiting with us today. If you're streaming us 
or if you're here in the sanctuary, there are some pink notepads in front of you, like that, like that. There you go, pink notepads. And I encourage you to take notes because you're going to remember most of the bullet points I give you today, but you're going to forget most of what I said until you go back and look at us on YouTube. Listen, listen. The first thing I want you to notice that look at some were prideful. Some of the people were prideful. Don't you know you can't win when you're full of pride? God can't do nothing with you. Oh, let me say it like this. God can do anything, but he chooses not to work with those who are full of themselves. Amen? Amen. Notice what happens starting at verse number one. Look at the criticism. Look at the criticism of Ephraim. After the Midianites were defeated down in the valley, they're on the run. And, and, and the men, God's people, are after them. And, 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 and uh, he's after the men of Ephraim. He, uh, 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 he, he tells the men of Ephraim, uh, help us. Gideon asked Ephraim, which are their blood brothers, part of the 12 tribes of Israel. He sends messengers out to say, tell the rest of the 12 tribes that we got the enemy on the run. So he sent messengers out to the, to the tribe of Ephraim and, and to uh, Naphtali and to Asher and Manasseh. He says, y'all, come on, come on, y'all, come on, help us. They're on the run now. We beat them in the valley with only 300. Really, God beat them in the valley with only 300. But now that they're on the run, y'all come on and help us. Y'all come on and help us. Now remember, these people that he sent out messages to, these are the ones who ran when it was 32,000. And he says, anybody who's scared and don't want to fight for the Lord, go home. And most of the men got up and went home. And so now he's calling on the ones who went home and says, now that they're on the run, will you help us? Now that you're on the run, will you help us? But look at the criticism. The people who he calls to come back to fight don't want to fight no more. They want to criticize. They're telling Gideon, Gideon, where were you? How come you didn't call us when, when you were fighting down in the valley? That's where you should have had us. How come you didn't call us then? Gideon could have said, because y'all ran like chickens. <laughs> yeah. They were angry with, with Gideon. They were angry with Gideon because he didn't call them up for war. They were actually jealous. Because he didn't expect to win. There's 32,000 initially against 135,000. And now that they've been defeated with only 300 by the grace of God, now they're jealous because they see that if we had stayed with the team, we would be on the victory. Wouldn't you be angry if you decided to quit a team that went to the Super Bowl and you found out everybody got a ring except you? I could have been, I could, you could have been, you could, I, I, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm trying, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not, you could have had a ring, but you ran, you could have had a ring, you could have been one of the victors, but now you eating popcorn in the stands like everybody else, and now they're jealous, church in your single life, in your work life, in your parenting, you need to learn to submit to the will of God. The scripture says in James 4, 7, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Let me tell you, it didn't say fight the devil. It said resist the devil. But before you can even resist him, you got to have the power of God in your life. you got to learn to submit. Somebody say submit. Submit is one of the hardest words in the Bible because nobody wants to submit. We don't want to submit to mom and daddy. We don't want to submit to the teacher. We don't want to submit to the police. We don't want to submit to authorities. We don't want to submit to the, the pastor. We don't want to submit to, the, to even to God. We don't want to submit to God because we don't like the way God is doing it. I don't like, I wouldn't do it that way. If that's the way he said doing it, just forget it. I'll stay home. Stay home. Stay home. And you know what? The air that you breathe in, turn that back into God. That's his air too. You sit there, I don't want to submit. That's the problem. Taking sides is not an option. Look, look at the control of Gideon. Instead of them, him going back at them and fussing at them, saying, y'all ran like chickens, he gave a soft answer. Everybody say soft answer. The scripture says in Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath. This is what he said. He says, Ephraim, 
y'all have more food and productivity than we do. And they said, well, yeah, yeah, you're right. We do, we do. So he stroked their ego, and they were pacified. Kind of cheap, isn't it? That's all they wanted was a little stroking to make their egos feel good. Yeah, we, we are the biggest tribe. Y'all the biggest tribe, but y'all the scariest tribe. But he didn't say that. He just said, y'all, y'all are more productive than we are. And when they said, yeah, then they stopped criticizing. Listen, when you are an authority, when you are a leader, you learn that some people are not with you. Everybody ain't with you. Everybody ain't with you, even when you are following the Lord. Gideon gave them the glory that they wanted, and they were satisfied. Listen, you can't do nothing at work, at church, at home, anywhere you live without somebody criticizing what you did. Because they were prideful, and their pride got in their way. That's why they ran home. So first, notice they were prideful. The second group are the political. Some were political. Have you seen people be political in your life? Haven't you seen people on your job, in your family, at your church? When issues come up, they go politics quick. That's why people say at work, it's two things we don't talk about. We don't talk about politics, and we don't talk about religion. Well, in here we can, because that's what's happening. I'm just telling you what's in the text. The simple request, there's a simple request, and then there's a shameful refusal. The request is this. On the run in verses 4 through 9, God's people are running through God's territory to get rid of the enemy. So it's like this. If I leave Skybridge Community Church right now and I run past your house and I'm exhausted because I've been fighting all night. Me and my men have been fighting all night. And we almost got the guys, but we need some bread. And we stop by your house and we say, oh, this is the so-and-so family. They go to Skybridge. We ring your doorbell and say, listen, can you help us out? We're part of, you know, this is Pastor Houghton, and these are some of the brothers with me, and we're running after the enemy. We're going to get them and say, can y'all at least give us some water and some bread? And he say, well, have y'all beat them yet? No, but then you ain't getting no bread. That's what they did. They asked the question, have you caught them? Are they in your hand? Well, no, not yet. Well, then when they're in your hand, then come back and get us. Because, see, if you get bread from us and they find out that we gave you bread and sustenance to strengthen yourself for the, for the victory, and you lose, they're coming after us. And so it's not politically expedient for me to help you with bread and water right now. So go on your way, and good luck. What? You just said, I'm your brother, and you're not going to feed your brother and your sister sustenance? That's in New Testament, too. God talks about those who at least give a cup of water to somebody in need. And you won't give your own family who's fighting for the nation, who's helping you. And you know that God called me to do this. My name is Gideon. These are my 300 men that are left over. And y'all were the chickens that ran. Are we asking if you ain't going to fight, at least give us some bread. And they said, we'll give you some bread when you come back. That's what it comes down to in this text. That's the request. So that's the, here's the shameful re- refusal. It was considered uh, 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 shameful not to help people in need. Uh, uh, it was considered shameful not to help people who were going through difficult times. So in the town of Sukkoth and in the town of Penuel, they all said the same thing. We scared. And if these mobsters find out we helped you and you don't win, they're going to take us out. So no, we won't help you right now, but good luck in your battle. Uh, uh, These people were not thankful for what God had already done. They're not thankful for the, 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 the example that God has already given. And they fail to realize that Gideon getting bread was a guarantee of future blessings. Don't you know if you bless God now, he will bless you later. Y'all, y'all, we, one of the problems we got as people, even people of God, we don't want to give God praise and glory until the victory comes. But you need to praise God already as though he already has won. Because see, you and God make a majority. It ain't nothing that you can't do with God on your side. Amen? 
Amen. But make sure you're being obedient and obedient servant to God so that he can bless you. Let me say it like this. You can't go and do dirt and then expect the victory on the other side. Amen. You got to be willing to give up what you believe in, what you think you ought to do, how you feel. It's not about your feelings because feelings are fickle. You can feel one way today and feel opposite tomorrow. But God is always the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. You better be ready to move when God says move. You better be ready to move when God says move, just like that. Today, there are some who play politics. Even now, there are some who play politics. They'll play politics about who's going to be governor, who's going to be president, whether to pass health care, whether to change taxes. Whatever it is, somebody is playing politics in our lives or with our lives. And you can't afford to be neutral. You can't afford to be neutral because it's going to affect you one way or another. It's going to affect you. Stop being indecisive. Stop being weak. Stop being scared. Stop being uh, 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 dispassionate. Stop being passive. You better learn to be active in God's kingdom. Take a position. Scripture says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Nah, it doesn't say as for me and my house, we'll sit on the fence. Or me and my house, we'll decide what happens after. The See, it's easy to take a side after the battle's over. You're always going to pick the winner. There's a team A and team B. And you find out the team A just beat team B. You say, well, we were always with team A. I always, they was my, you know, that's my favorite color. That's my favorite quarterback. No, you just with them now because they won. It's easy to go to the Super Bowl when you are after the game is over. It's easy to talk about the game after the game is over on Monday. After you saw the Sunday game on Monday, you said, I knew that was going to happen. The quarterback ain't no good. His receiver dropped the ball to me. Yeah, you can talk all that trash after the game. Are you ready to give sacrifice and commitment to the team? Do you only cheer for your team after the game is over? Or are you willing to say, I'm with y'all, win or lose, I'm with y'all? Stop being political. There were some who were prideful. There were some who were political. Thirdly, there are some who are persistent. Somebody say persistent. Persistent means I don't give up because God doesn't give up. While some of the people walked in pride and others allowed personal political agendas to determine their allegiance, Gideon and his men simply per persevered in their work. In other words, they kept going, listen, I know there are times in your life when you feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like giving up on yourself. Sometimes you feel like giving up on your family. Sometimes you feel like giving up on people in your life. The person who works in a cubicle next to you, the person that you're getting ready to retire from, the person that you work at it with the, at the bank, at the grocery store. There are times folks just wear you thin, and you feel like giving up and throwing in the towel. Listen, you're looking at the example of a persevering mama and daddy who prayed for my hard head prayed for my hard head and I'm back and I'm in the church listen notice how they continued notice how they continued or how they persevered instead of being discouraged and defeated by the criticism of the of Ephraim and by the callousness of the two cities they stayed on task listen you got to learn to not be discouraged you got to learn to not be distracted you got to learn to stay on task when everybody else walks away. I love the phrase in verse 4 which says, they were faint, yet they pursued them. The men were tired, they were weary, but they kept fighting. You notice the difference between those who win and those who lose? You know why football plays four quarters? Because even if you are ahead in, qu in quarter number one, you can't lose the game. Or even if you're losing in the first three quarters, you can win in the fourth. Because, see, it's perseverance. Uh, that's why we play four quarters. One team can talk trash for three whole quarters and lose the game at the last minute on the fourth quarter. But you got to persevere. It looks like you're going to win. It looks like you're going to lose. 
But it's the team that perseveres that wins. It's the team that perseveres that wins. Your marriage looks shaky. Your singleness is questionable. Your faith in God is iffy. You got to persevere through all of that. Your children and grandchildren drive you crazy. The children of your mom, your mama's children or your, your daddy's kids, they drive you crazy. Your siblings, but persevere. If you got mama drama or daddy drama, persevere. Your money looks funny, persevere. You can't give up. If that's the case, I would be broke today. I told you that time. There are times as a believer when God gives us, I believe, Sister Dontria, a financial stress test. Uh, uh, can you still worship me when you got two mortgages and decreased income? I'm telling y'all what I know. When Linda and I had the house we live in, the rental house that we couldn't fill, and we're paying two mortgages, and we're sitting there, Father, I know you know, and we're sitting there shaking our heads saying, God, you're going to have to come through. You're going to have to come through. I'm sitting there telling my wife, I told Linda after the fact, I told her after the fact, I said, Linda, what I didn't tell you was two years ago, this is after the house sold. I told her, I said, baby, I didn't tell you this, but a couple of years ago, I'm sitting there scratching my head, and I was kind of compromised with the Lord, Mike. I'm sitting there going like, well, Lord, I think you'll understand if I don't pay my tithes and offers this month, and because if I don't do that, I could pay down some of these bills over here. Lord, say, you persevere. You keep worshiping me and doing what you're supposed to. I'll take care of the stuff on the side, the stuff that you don't understand, the stuff that you can't see, the stuff that you can't touch, the stuff that goes on in the spirit realm and you can't figure it out, but it touches your physical realm. I got you, Russ, but this is a stress test to see where your perseverance lies. And don't you know he came through? And he always comes through. I'm telling y'all what I know. I'm what I know. Look at how they persevered. I remember some men uh, went with me to a men's retreat years ago, about 15 years ago, 12 years ago. Talking about persevering and getting tired of people and getting frustrated with folks. Me and another preacher at a, when we were at another church, we put on a men's retreat every year. And it's so hard to organize and get guys passionate about so we told them, we're going to take you out to Mo Ranch uh, uh, up in the hill country in Texas, and we're going to have a men's retreat. And the, nobody signed up. Nobody signed up. Nobody gave, uh, gave us money. Nobody put money down for the men's retreat. And they just kept walking by me saying, what are we going to be doing? I ain't going to be going up there on an old tree with a bunch of guys up there. What are we going to be talking about? Uh, I ain't going to be up there crying, snotting, and telling all my business. I said, well, man, stay here. Don't go. And so I'm sitting there praying, I said, Lord, where do we start? Lord Jesus, you got to come through. And so here we are, ready for the men's retreat coming in a few weeks. And, and at that time, most of the men had not signed up. So we make this announcement. And this is the, the church announcement that always works on everybody. Next week is the last Sunday to sign up for the retreat. <laughs> then all of a sudden, everybody come running. Wait, 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 how much is it going to cost now? Where are we going? When are we coming back? What time do we have to be there? What do I need to bring? I already answered all that. I done talked about this for six months. And now you want to know the details. And finally they show up. We get there and more men show up than I had ever anticipated. God got the glory, y'all. I'm serious. I'm serious. I thought we were going to get about 10 guys, you know. We got like 30. We didn't have enough. We, we were sitting there going, and I'm sitting there, me and the other preacher sitting there going like, my God, look at look what's going on. But it was so taxing, so frustrating. I said to the other preacher, and the other preacher said to me, we're never, we're never, ever trying to organize a bunch of guys for a men's retreat again. There were so many men who were delivered from different situations in their life, whether it was drugs or sex or alcohol or self-defeat. There were so many things that happened there that blessed for years, and people to this day would walk up and say, you remember that retreat y'all put on? You blessed us there. I changed at the men's retreat. So after the men's retreat was over, we did this. We said this. We both looked at each other. The next year, we said, okay, let's try it again. And we put that retreat on for another three, three years after that because every year, God came through. 
And every year there was criticism. Every year there were obstacles. Every year it looked like it wasn't going to work. But every year God got the, got the praise and the glory. Somebody say amen right there. You just got to persevere. You can't quit. You persist even when it looks like it ain't going to work. Those who persevere enjoy the best of what God has to offer. Remember this. God's plan is to prosper you and not to harm you. So if you're struggling with life, don't you quit. It's in the Bible. It's in his word. Remember, be honest with God about your feelings. It's in his word, Psalm 13. God has promised to strengthen you when you need it. It's in his word, Colossians 1, 11. Remember, you don't lose heart. It's in his word in 2 Corinthians 4. Remember, when our hearts condemn us, we can't give up. It's in his word, 1 John 3. Remember, sometimes he speaks not in a roar, but in a still, small voice. It's in his word in 1 King 19. Remember, you are not alone, Deuteronomy 31, 6. Remember, though we make mistakes, we are still in God's hands, Psalm 37, 23. Remember that mistakes happen, and we sometimes fall, but don't you give up. You get back up. It's in his word, Proverbs 24, 16. Remember, nothing can separate us love of God. It's in his word in Romans 8, 38 and 39. Not taking sides is not an option. How can they conclude? How can they end this? Gideon came back with the leftover enemy, the Midianites. But then it gets gritty. When he came to Sukkoth, and to Penuel, the two cities where his brothers, the tribes, refused to give them bread. There were two sins that had been committed. One was hospitality, and the other was turning their backs. Now, the first one probably don't mean anything to you and me, because when you and I think about hospitality, we think about going down to the Life Center is what we're going to do in a few minutes. And we're going to have coffee and pastries. And we're going to sit around and laugh and talk with each other. And that's our idea of hospitality. But in the Old Testament times, hospitality was a much more, uh, it was a much deeper issue. Hospitality means you be hospitable to the stranger who comes into the city. See, in those days, there was no buckies when you travel. There was no stop and go when you travel. There was no snacks and Gatorade on the shelves. There was no potato chips and, and, and candy and Twinkies for you to eat. So when you came off the dusty road, the only place you could eat and get water was at somebody's house. So when you knocked on the door as a stranger, everybody or anybody was expected to open the door, let you in, give you water, and give you food because your life was at hand. You were in desperate need of food. There were no igloos to carry water to keep it cool in the summer and keep it warm in the winter. That's why when Mary and Joseph showed in with Jesus, to give birth to Jesus, and they found out there's no room in the inn, it was considered unhospitable because this young couple, along with all these other people in this caravan, are hungry and tired. You let them in. And to not let them in is against God. You're saying, I'd rather let you die than to bring you in as a stranger. So you're already on God's bad side when you don't let people in in hospitality in the Middle East. The second sin, when they got to Sukkoth and Penuel, remember in chapter 6, at the top, the reason we're in this mess in the first place is God's people had turned their back on God. God let the enemy come in for seven years. Here we are near the end of the story. 
and they're turning their back on God again. When God's people representing God through Gideon and his 300 men show up in a city and Gideon says, I care more about my men right now and that they continue on with some nourishment and strength. And you deny hospitality and you deny God's people doing God's work God's way. You've sinned against God twice after God already showed you that you messed up in chapter 6, verse 1. Now here we are in chapter 8, and you still acted a fool. Yeah. Haven't you learned that God wasn't happy with you then, and he ain't happy with you now? So here we are. But if you remember, earlier in chapter 8, Gideon said, that's okay, when I get back, you're going to get it, but you're going to get spanked with thorns and briars. What he meant was, you're going to get spanked in a way to show you that God really ain't happy with you. Because, see, you are a cancer in the community. you still doing evil after God done exposed your evil, after God done showed your dirt, after God done showed your corruption, after God done showed how you mistreat people in his name. And yet, you call yourself the church or you call yourself God's people. How dare you? Let your pride and let your politics get in the way of doing God's work. So I got something special for you. So Gideon shows up in the city. And God, Gideon is looking for the elders of the city who lead out the rest of the city. And this is what they do. The scripture says they roped the leaders, the elders, and they drug all 70 of them through stickers and briars. Have you seen sticker briars in Texas? Have you seen the cactus that get this big and they got thorns all over them? I've been stuck by them. I, I've been stuck by them. They got cactus in West Texas. They, they had cactus in my backyard in my previous house. How would you like it if you get drugged through the cactus and they got drugged through the thorns and thistles until they died? The next town, Penuel, they had their tower that they were worshiping, we think, knocked over. He says, you're still worshiping the tower or what the tower represents to you. And Gideon and his people went in and tore out what they liked. There are times in our lives where God has to rip out that which we worship to replace with what, who, who he is. God ain't going to take second best. God ain't going to take second fiddle to whatever you like. Listen, how do you know if you're still doing idol worship? Wherever or whatever or whoever takes up your time and your money is your idol. God says, I ain't going to have it. And you say, Pastor, don't that sound kind of harsh? God is letting you know what's harsh is the way you have mistreated people in God's name. You God's people called by his name, but you won't humble yourself. You won't pray. You won't seek his face. You won't turn from your wicked ways, but you want God's blessings. God says, you get my blessings on my terms. You don't just get my blessings because you'll call the church. You get my blessings on my terms. You didn't give my people water, I ain't going to give you your blessings. You won't let them in when they're hungry, I'm not going to give you your blessings. You don't understand why God has ignored your cries. You won't do what God says do. Taking sides is not an option. You're either for God or you are against God. If you could sum up your life, I'm done. If you could sum up your life today, how would it look? Would you say that you are walking in pride? Would you say that you are walking all about the political advantage? Or would you say, I am persisting and walking with God? There's no neutral stand. In other words, well, this is my friend, and this is my friend too, and I just don't want to get involved. One of them's wrong. One of them's following God, the other one's not. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Whoever, according to Luke eleven twenty three, 23, whoever, this is Jesus talking, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather, scatters. I'll leave you with this. It's a little story, a little illustration from a guy named Grady Henley. And it goes like this. There's a story about four people named everybody, somebody, 
anybody and nobody. There was an important job that needed to be done. And everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. Are we going to sit on the sidelines and expect to be rewarded as part of the winning team? Or are we going to step out in faith and have the courage to stand for the Lord, even when victory doesn't seem likely, but you ought to know that you and God make a majority. Somebody give God praise in the house.